Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities and other inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. This afternoon, I am very excited to have with us in conversation, Dr. Tia Dole, Chief Clinical Operations Officer at the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project was founded in 1998, providing crisis intervention. And it was an Academy Award winning short and powerful film, Trevor, which indeed was the catalyst, I believe, for its founding. This film, by the way, is available on YouTube and I recommend for all of you to see it for it remains as relevant today as it was when it was first made. Dr. Dole, thank you for taking the time to join us in this conversation. Thank you so much. And I have to say that introduction, I just wanted to keep myself on mute and listen to you talk more. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, but we wanna hear from you. <laughs> sure. And so, in fact, before digging down into the many important issues which the Trevor Project addresses, I'm going to begin by asking you to tell us how you became involved with the project and the work you do with them. Great. Um, so it was sort of a, I would consider a circuitous process. I started out my career as a, what we call baby psychologist, really interested in early psychosis. Um, and when you work with people who are early psychosis, you tend to work with people who are very suicidal. And in that process, I had gotten a lot of experience working with very suicidal people. And when I was a trainee and, and a postdoc, people kept giving me clients who were suicidal. They said, Tia will take them. And because of that, disproportionately, I ended up treating a lot of folks who identified in the LGBTQ community. Um, and that's sort of, that was sort of the beginning of working with this community. Um, and then through my career, I maintain a private practice where I see black and brown queer folks um, and sort of continue that specialty. And so I came around to the Trevor Project um, with the intention of really focusing on black and brown LGBTQ folks with the understanding that I would consider this population to be the most vulnerable in the United States. Um, and with the hope that we could pivot some of our services to help them. You're right in talking about uh, the uh, LGBTQ youth who are black and brown as being some mm -hmm. of the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and yet some of the most ignored yeah. and forgotten about, particularly in terms of services. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the year that we've just come through and the impact of COVID and the way in which it sort of disproportionately impacted certain communities, mm -hmm. again, the one community rarely if ever mentioned and indeed ignored is mm -hmm. that of queer, brown, and mm -hmm. black youth. Mm -hmm. Yet, a survey revealed that what 80% of LGBTQ youth stated that COVID made their living situation more stressful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that didn't take into account the intersectional identity of, of race and ethnicity. That's right. And mm -hmm. I, wanna, I, wa I wanna get to that. I wanna get to both of these things. So let's look for a minute. What one in three a survey that uh, uh, was also taken said that they found their home to uh, not be affirming. Can you speak to that and speak to some of the issues that you uh, were brought forward to you on there? Because the Trevor Project set up a hotline mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during COVID. What were some of the things and the concerns mm -hmm. that these youth were talking about that we just haven't thought about? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I'm going to separate this in terms of class too, right? And so when you, you know, one thing we, when we think about COVID, um, we tend to think, I think about sort of middle Americans who were able to suddenly go remote, work from home, all of those things. But there were a lot of Americans who were still going to work, right? Um, and I, I'm gonna flag that and put a pin in that and, and circle back around to it. So, you know, during COVID, all these young people found themselves suddenly yanked back at home. Um, and for a young person who identifies as LGBTQ, you can generally have two experiences where going to school, you can find your people, right? You can find your community, you have your GSA Gay Straight Alliance, 
Um, you can be your full self at school. Um, and then you found yourself back at home where your parents might not be okay with this identity. And so in some ways, um, people could not express themselves, right? Um, and then the, on the other side, some young people found that, well, school was dangerous for them um, and that they were finding safety at home. But for the most part, um, hearing from our young people is that people found themselves having to make a decision to sort of not be who they are, not be their true selves at home in order to keep the peace, right? They want to use a specific pronoun. They want to dress a certain way. Potentially, they want to change their name to fit what feels uh, more like their real identity. And in order to be home with your parents for months on end with no end in sight, um, this, this is what, what happened. And so we had the young people sort of calling, texting us from closets, from locked bathrooms. People found that they didn't have any privacy, um, feeling extremely stressed, wanting to go out. And then also on top of it, you know, if we went out, um, then I came back, I'm living with my grandmother, I could get her sick. Um, and so there was, there was um, a sense of being frozen in place. Um, and if they did go out and see people to get that support, um, then a, a huge sense of a guilt and shame that they could have put their family members at risk. Yeah, you know, we heard a lot about, for instance, women and children mm -hmm. who were forced to quarantine with their abusers, yes. right? Yes. But what you were talking about, in essence, are these children, LGBTQ youth, mm -hmm forced to quarantine with their abuser and mm -hmm. then thinking about emotional mm -hmm. and psychological mm -hmm. abuse. What is the impact? And I heard you talk about not able to use their pronouns. And we just think that that's, we take that for granted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's about identity mm -hmm. and affirmation and mm -hmm. well-being. Can you speak to that? Well, you know, it's it's funny because there there's such a debate now about using the you, calling people what they want to be called. It's always funny to me. And I live in New York City, so I realize that I come from a sort of specific environment. My children go to New York City public schools. Odd, you know, everybody asks about pronouns. That's that's it's not even a thing. But in other communities, um, you know, pronouns feel really, I think feel like onerous to, to different folks, right? And I will say that, that in the last 12, 18 months, we're seeing a cultural backlash, right? We had a change of administration and that these different communities are sort of uh, double downing on things about gender and uh, gender identity, LGBTQ identity. So when you think about someone's pronouns, it's, it's a very simple, easy thing to do where I, that young people experience quite a bit of resistance that is based in not just their own child, but also changes in society, resistance to change. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it's something that can push someone over the edge, right? It's just that one last time, like, I don't wanna be misgendered again. Um, and I, you know, I can't take it. And that's what we hear. Yeah, see, and that's, I just want to emphasize that that mm -hmm. what may, what is an easy thing to mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. that society refuses yeah. to do and resist is not so simple in relationship to people whose humanity mm -hmm. and identity you're disavowing. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. one of refusal to not address people the way in which they want to be addressed or identify mm -hmm. people the way which want to be identified can push them over the edge. Well, when you think, if you think about, like, I always think about, and I don't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. You know, this last 18 months is sort of like our 1969. Yeah. And by that mean, it's a really trans transformational time in society. And you think about the 1960s where folks wanted to wear, Black folks, for instance, wanted to wear their hair natural, getting a lot of negative feedback from family members, from communities, like, what, what is this Afro? What is this hairstyle? That's you know, and, and I think it's, it's similar insofar as people wanting to be themselves, no longer be compliant to societal norms, um, and then getting a lot of pushback um, around um, being who they are. Um, they we're in the same spot. No, that's 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 exactly right, and I and I like the analogy, and I mm -hmm. I remember in my own life wanting to uh, cut my hair and the response right mm -hmm. to to uh, to that from my family mm -hmm. and others, and it, it leads me as you make this connection to the intersectionality, mm -hmm. and you know we're talking about uh, queer BIPOC, 
mm -hmm. uh, youth. And it's uh, we're having this conversation mm -hmm. during the month of July when mm -hmm. the mental health mm -hmm. uh, of uh, a queer of uh, BIPOC mm -hmm. uh, children and youth uh, is the focus. What are you seeing there? They seem to be even the most vulnerable, and particularly mm -hmm. in this time with mm -hmm. COVID, where two pandemics came together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with protests for mm -hmm. uh, Black lives and, mm -hmm. and dealing with COVID. Mm -hmm. What 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 did you see there? So I so it was really I, I'm going to go back. So we had we had the wildfires. This is like January. Yep. Then we had, which is something that was actually impacting the world. Right, we were seeing that. Then COVID happened, and then George Floyd, and we had our social justice uprising. And we, within the LGBTQ community, you know, we saw this even at Trevor. It was really interesting to me the way it manifested, which is Black and Brown queer folks were like saying to other white queer folks, you've never seen us. We've mm -hmm. been here the whole time. You haven't stood up for us. We've been invisible in this community. So I'm going to say in this level, right, we're talking about the peers, um, there was this, this uprising saying, especially when you're talking about black trans folks, um, saying we've been here this whole time and you never stood up for us. And it's time for your allyship to become a verb, an action rather than an adjective, a descriptive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and requiring um, you know, white folks in the LGBTQ community to do something more than just be, say, oh, we care about intersectional identity. So that was interesting. And then you have sort of like black queer folks who are kind of at the forefront of protest. I mean, you think about what happened last summer, it was incredible, led by young people who were really saying, we are not taking this anymore. And I think pushed towards change in a completely different way than, than I've seen in my lifetime personally. Um, and so I think, you know, there was this sense of being fed up, but also feeling very rejected by our society. Um, and sort of like, is there a place for me here? There's no place for me at church. Um, people don't want me it's here. They don't want to, right? They don't want to use my pronouns. I'm not in school anymore. I can't see my friends. I'm, I, you know, and, you know, at the time there were all these laws coming down to limit the rights of LGBTQ folks, um, still happening even now. Um, and, in, and then of course we had the, the election waited several days, right? So our young people were so stressed, stressed, reaching out to us. And then we had the insurrection in January. So, it, you know, and now we have our second wave and we, you know, you and I both know that black and brown folks have disproportionately been affected by COVID by loss. A lot of these young people are being raised by grandparents who've died, um, you know, due to COVID or, you know, a lack of access to resources. And so um, it's... <laughs> It's just a cumulative effect. Um, uh, and you know, one of the things I, I, I always tend to say about the community is like, these young people are so resilient, but it, it's not on them to be resilient because re you know, when you say like, oh, this person's so resilient, it implies that people who aren't bouncing back that something's wrong with them. Being traumatized by trauma is a normal response. <laughs> Right. They don't have the to bounce. <laughs> they don't have to. And here's the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to be resilient just mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. We're asking these young people to be resilient mm -hmm. just to get through daily yeah. life. And, yeah. and, and re it shouldn't require resilience mm -hmm. to have, have well-being. Yeah. And, and the other side of this, and as you talk about this, it has real impact because we find that queer youth of color are more likely, right, yes. to attempt uh, death by suicide. Yes. But uh, uh, can, can you speak to that? Well, you know, I'll start, I'll start back. One of the myths, maybe it's a, not a myth, but let's say one thing I, I've heard through my whole career, you know what, Black folks don't make a suicide attempt. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And, you know, the research mm -hmm. says it's not true now. Maybe it was true then, who knows? You know, it's not, I don't know who's conducting that research. I don't know what it's based on. We don't have, a, you know, I would say post-death um, psychological autopsies are often not done on um, uh, suicide. But we know now that rates of suicide are, are very high, especially for black boys, um, sure. astronomical at this point with completed suicides. And so um, that myth is gone. 
Um, we know that uh, black and brown people in the queer community are at higher risk. Um, and it's because of the intersectional identity, right? And it's not because of who they are, it's because of the way society treats them, right? It's in the minority stress model. They are getting it from every direction. Um, and oftentimes you have folks who have to, um, you know, hide who they are in order to function. You live in a small town in Louisiana. Um, you can either move out of the town and go to someplace that's safer, or you hide who you are so you can maintain your family unit. Um, and so people are constantly making a decision between authenticity and safety um, when you're black and brown and in the queer community. On, on all fronts, as mm -hmm. you have pointed out, not mm -hmm. just in terms of their gendered sexual mm -hmm. identity, but mm -hmm. their race or ethnicity, et cetera, and trying to find a safe space just mm -hmm. to be. And I, I want to get to that in a minute in terms of uh, religious and faith communities. But, mm -hmm. but before we do, I want to say something more uh, about, and you brought it up, the legislation, et cetera. Mm -hmm than the policies that are uh, being passed. And I, especially in relationship mm -hmm. to our schools, we're hearing a lot uh, these days, the attack, as mm -hmm. you know, sort of this now pushback uh, on against uh, critical race theory. This is, this is <laughs> right, you know, the people talking about it, they don't even know what it is. I know, they're like, uh, what, what is it? I don't know. Right, so <laughs> and it's and talking about it like it's new. Yeah, you know, I, was, yeah. uh, I had a conversation with somebody about this the other day. I said, "Well, you know, it's no different, really, than what Du Bois talked about about the color line." But as much attention as we pay to critical race theory mm -hmm. and the way in which this is being attacked in schools, etc. Actually, There's Texas something. just passed a law. That's right. Did you see that? All right. Yeah. Which uh, what was it? it? Bans um, Banning the requirement of teaching about MLK. Think about Native American. That's right. You can't talk, teach about that. You can't teach about, you can't teach the 1619 Project is banned and certain yeah. other books uh, are banned. Yeah. So, but for what we've ignored going along with this, and now you don't even think of the intersectionality for mm -hmm. uh, queer youth, are these no homo promo <laughs> uh, laws in school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, oh, I can't th think of uh, the name of the sort of other descriptor uh, mm -hmm. that that is given uh, in which you can't speak about LGBTQ people, mm -hmm. LGBTQ history, mm -hmm. LGBT, unless it's in a negative way. Mm -hmm. This has Erasure. a real impact. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, it's interesting because you know I saw some meme about this, and it was like you know you know it's bad when when um, a country doesn't want to teach wants you to teach it teach young people about its own history, yeah. um, and you know I think what I'm seeing is is uh, is that there's a there's a deep fear um, for folks who have power and having queer uh, queer young people, black and brown young people know their own history, right? And so, it, you know, people are trying to prevent them from learning things about themselves and about the past. And because what it does is it, it takes it takes some of their power away. Exactly. I will say that for queer youth in particular, they are generally speaking way on top of things in a way that I wasn't when I was a young person. So all these laws, they know what's going on. So when the law gets passed, for instance, that says like a young person can't participate in middle school sports that they identify as trans, right? We hear about it directly on our lines right away, feeling scared. Um, and, and by scared, I mean, am I at risk? Is someone at my school going to hurt me? Um, sometimes we hear young people talk about what their family members are saying about these laws, like supporting them. And um, it keeps them closeted at home because they're scared that their family members are gonna turn on them. But then what happened during COVID is, is they were like, okay, college, I'm going to wait for college. I'm going to wait for college. And then no college. They couldn't go. Right. And it was devastating for a, young, a lot of young people because then they were again, stuck at home with people who were invalidating their experience. And that's just for, for, for middle-class kids who could go to college, right? You have a whole different thing when you don't have the ability to sort of, oh, I'm going to do that college and then graduate and then go off on my own. That, that implies a certain degree class, right? of access to wealth, um, and um, which is something that I feel like we haven't heard enough about, about 
sort of low income folks who don't have the ability to go away to college, what's happening to them now? Yeah, and what we know as you, as you uh, speak about that is that uh, queer youth, particularly queer, queer youth of color are disproportionately yeah. a part yeah. of the uh, homeless population Correct. and disproportionately impacted with food insecurity, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, so it leads us, oh my gosh, the time so is leaving us. So I do want to get definitely to this because we're talking about spaces mm -hmm. where people can feel affirmed mm -hmm. uh, for who they are and mm -hmm. that are life nurturing, right? And mm -hmm. not life negating spaces. And mm -hmm. we're finding that LBGTQ youth uh, are having a hard time finding mm -hmm. those spaces. Mm -hmm. One would think one of those spaces would be in faith and religious uh, mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are, sometimes yeah. they aren't. And right. when they are, it's good. Mm -hmm. And when they aren't, it is devastating mm -hmm. because you're mm -hmm. suggesting that you are not a sacred mm -hmm. child of whomever mm -hmm. you call God to be. Can you speak to that? And what have you, what role would you like to see mm -hmm. faith communities and religious communities play that they haven't played? Well, you know, it, it's funny because you, a lot of, there are so many faith-based organizations that help folks who struggle with homelessness, food insecurity. But when you think about LGBTQ young people, the most vulnerable people, they experience themselves as being rejected by faith-based organizations. And I always, I, whenever I think about this, I think about what is our job as adults? I'm going to speak about myself as a grown-up, right? Our job as a grown up is to care for young people, right? Yeah. Our job is to be here for young people, create a space for them to thrive, right? Help, help them plant roots, help them fly or whatever you wanna say. But our job, regardless of you know, what the young person thinks, what their pronouns are, from my perspective, my job as an adult is to be a stabilizing force in a young person's life. And I think that folks lose sight of that job that you know especially in, when you think about well how am I interpreting the scripture how am I it doesn't matter right all the scripture often says <laughs> from my from my understanding is to um care for your brother as you yourself right all of it says the same thing but there's something about having a queer identity that makes it challenging for other people to look past it and see the person and so I think oops are you frozen or am I frozen? I hope it's not me. I think you guys are good. Okay, good. I was going to say, um, you know, I think that what happens with, I think queer folks, especially in faith-based communities is a dehumanization. Um, that instead of seeing them, they see an identity. And I think this is my call to adults is, is take a look at yourself. Yeah. Are you seeing this young person Who's, who's, you can see very clearly that potentially they're struggling with identity and you're not standing up for them, right? Your role, especially in faith-based communities is to stand up for people in need. And if we're not doing that, then you know that you're not being a good Christian, a good Muslim, but uh, Islam, Muslim, not being a good Jewish person, like you, your job is to care for, for the youth. Um, and, and that's, that's always my call, call is, is that, that's what you got to do, even if you well, disagree with them. Well, you, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it better because not to do that mm -hmm. is indeed a betrayal of mm -hmm. your own faith tradition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and so we are called to recognize that every single human being, every mm -hmm. person that has breath is sacred, mm -hmm. uh, then, and, and call to respect and mm -hmm. treat them as mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. and to create situations that are life affirming mm -hmm. as i always say and not life negating mm -hmm. uh and that we must call our faith and religious communities out when they betray mm -hmm. their very call uh, well and, and i'll add this you know take a look at your choir yeah <laughs> yeah so, but you know, people, people, it's, it's an interesting thing because I tend to see, you know, we have a lot of folks at Trevor who, you know, used to attend church, great singers. You like the queer folks in your choir, right. you like them in the band, but you don't want to accept them in your community. That's and right. so it's sort of like, I would say the equivalent is like, you know, white folks like our music, That's right. they like our art, but they don't want us at the dinner table. It's the same. It's the same thing. 
Well, and it's it's a part of this language that we've mm -hmm. heard during COVID, you know, mm -hmm. about essential workers, but these mm -hmm. very essential workers, we don't consider essential human beings. Correct. Right? Yep. And and so, and that's the way we treat mm -hmm. uh, uh, queer people in our faith communities. Oh, they're essential workers for us mm -hmm. in terms of musicians or whatever, mm -hmm. but they aren't essential human beings. Correct. Right? And yep. you were so right. Let us see the way in which those of us who have been marginalized mm -hmm. and subjugated in the wider community, do we want to do that? Mm -hmm. The same thing that's been done to us. So well, I and it's really about, it's a replication, right? It's like, a, it's like a version of white supremacy. That's, well, it is white supremacy. That is right. It's, white. it's being, because, be, because if you think, look at communities and, you know, before they've been, you know, indoctrinated by white supremacy, there's always been, there's always been queer folks. Queer folks are always here. That's They're right. Always That's here. right. You know, and well, so, I, yeah. No, because I like to say from my bench, and then we'll end with uh, the, the question here because we, because uh, I promise to get you out of here. But you know, Tia, you're so right when you say that queer folks have always been here. I like to always say, from my theological and faith perspective, look, God's creation has never been binary. <laughs> uh, uh, and the, whether it's the human or non-human creation and people say, how do you know, look around. Mm -hmm. And so in so many ways, it seems to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. that uh, people who move beyond these mm -hmm. gender con binary constructions mm -hmm. are bringing us in so many ways closer mm -hmm. to God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Closer to whatever we, this creator mm -hmm. who, you know, creation is a reflection of. And so I agree with you. And so I always say, we got to catch up yes. uh, with God. And, yes. and, and, and the queer community helps us to do that. I think of uh, native religions, they talk about sort of uh, third gendered persons, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and they are the most respected. So, so you're right. So that our faith communities would, uh, it's a shame that we have to catch up as opposed to lead the way. Mm -hmm. But there, but that's the thing is I feel a lot of hope because I think, you know, especially when you're talking about communities of color, that black and brown folks are the most forgiving, yeah, accepting group of people. And what I would like us to do is to use that same forgiveness, that grace, that acceptance for the LGBTQ young people in our communities. Yeah, yeah. And just how about some compassion? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I not only treat people the way you would want to be treated, but mm -hmm. I always say, don't withhold from another that which you would not want withheld from mm -hmm. yourself. Exactly. Right? On all levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to get you out of here. Okay. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> two last quick questions, because this, this, this question, I, I must ask, particularly since we've just had this conversation, working with the Trevor Project and in the work that you do and trying to bring people to just this place of mm -hmm. affirming the mm -hmm. humanity of others, mm -hmm. you are working, you have to bring some people in communities along, you are sure. working across differences. Right. How do you do that? How do you lead across differences to get to this place? Everybody is a human. Mm -hmm. Every, we all have humanity. I think the way that our society goes is, we tend to, again, dehumanize other people if they disagree with us, if they don't live the way, if they look different than us. And so for me personally, I really try to see beyond um, the mask that everyone's wearing. Great. So the common ground is the affirmation of our mm -hmm. common humanity. Mm -hmm. T, I want to get you out on this question. If you were to close your eyes, <laughs> right? And from the perspective of the work that you do mm -hmm. with queer youth and mm -hmm. queer youth of color and in the Trevor Project, mm -hmm. what would a just society look like? Where the leaders look like the followers. Mm. Mm. Where the leaders look like the followers, which means that we have created mm -hmm. a space. Mm -hmm for everyone to live into mm -hmm. the fullness mm -hmm. of whomever they have mm -hmm. been created to mm -hmm. be. Tia, we could go on forever. We have gone too long. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tia Dole, for this conversation, most especially for the work that you are doing. And I want to commend to everyone the, Tia, uh, the Trevor Project, please go online mm -hmm. and look the project up and get involved. Be an ally and let that allyship be a verb. 
Mm-hmm. Not now. Thank, Thank you. you. It was lovely. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you.